founder, co-founder of Uber, Travis Kalanick. And um, I, I know that most of you guys are expecting some major news from this company, so I, I don't want to beat around the bush. Uh, we've had reporters ambush you. Uh, we know how you got here. Uh, do you want to give it to us straight? Uh, well, the big news, and some of you may have found this already, is that... Uh, no tweeting, guys. I can tweet. Okay. It's all right. Cool. Uh, Uber just launched in Aspen. You heard so we put, we put cars up this morning at 7 a.m., and uh, you now don't have to wait for a shuttle anymore. Uh, <laughs> so, of course, the logical question is, how did you get here? Uh, how did I get here? I got here via an Uber. <coughs> Excuse me, via an Uber. So, of course. Uh, okay, so <laughs> Travis, you and Garrett, uh, Garrett Camp, yep. you launched this company three very short years ago. And lay the land. I mean, you're on the ground in 36, 37 cities, if yes, Aspen 37. is a city. Aspen's here for three days, All so right. it counts as one of our cities, too. For the next three days, it's 37. Uh, you've launched internationally. Yep. Um, you've said that the company, the, the early markets are profitable. Yep. Um, let's really break to what is the thing everybody's talking about. Um, so you have confirmed uh, Uber is raising money. Correct. Um, I've heard that the current raise is, is almost complete and that the value of the company is, is likely to be higher than Airbnb's two and a half billion dollars. Uh, is this something you can confirm for us? Um, you have to ask that question. Of course uh, I have to ask that question. So our, the, the party line is that we are not commenting on fundraising discussions we may or may not be having. Um, <laughs> and uh, that was an is interesting information. Um, I don't know what else to say. Uh, there, you know. There are, there are probably one or two folks we're talking to whom we've signed NDAs with who are uh, particularly loose with information, um, but that information is not correct. Okay, so let's move on then. Um, let's say that a company like yours were to have a valuation north of two and a half billion dollars. Do you believe that Uber is a business that could command that? Oh, the hypothetical. <laughs> um, the, uh, here's what I would say. Um, our numbers are really, really good, um, and the, the multiples that you see in the public market are, are around companies that are growing like 50% or you know, 40%. You could take their price to sales ratios, and um, we could come in, well, shoot, I'm, going, I'm getting stuck. Um, <laughs> shit. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're doing great. <laughs> okay, let's go to the business. Um, so I, uh, I am an Uber user, as are, I would say, many people in the room. Raise your hand if you've been in an Uber vehicle. All right. We have a couple of people who know how the service works. Thank you, guys. Um, and for those who know how the service works, many of us have noticed in the last year or so that um, things that look suspiciously not like rides keep sneaking into the mix. Hmm. By that I mean um, you had a promotion over Valentine's Day where you delivered roses. Yeah. Uh, On-demand roses. On-demand roses. Bouquet um, of roses inside of five minutes in dozens of cities around the world. And in the process, On Valentine's thankfully, Day, we saved marriages. Thankfully, you reminded a lot of us that the day existed. Uh, we also had the July 3rd, the helicopter in New York, and, and you just had this ice cream thing. And it, yeah. and it got me to thinking, is Uber more than cars? Can it be? I mean, the way we look at what Uber is, is it's the cross, the cross between lifestyle, which is give me what I want and give it to me right now, which we've seen online, right? We all remember it was like instant gratification. It was like the, the wave of the future in the early 2000s, right? Give me what I want, give it to me right now and the logistics to get it to you, right? So today, we're in the business of delivering cars. We're delivering a car to you that you then can do whatever you want with. Um, well, the car has a driver as well. Um, but we've done things like uh, last Friday, we did Uber ice cream, um, 33 cities around the world. Uh, it, was, it was essentially on-demand ice cream trucks. Right. right. So you push a button in 33 cities, and an ice cream truck would come. And right. people were reliving their childhood memories and they got pretty pumped. And uh, I mean, and, was, and some of us, I, I might point out, were just pushing that button over and over again. Until they got it. Dreaming you, about our childhood. Well, memory. well, because, well, so yeah, there were some people who didn't get it. But it's because if we were to 
the only way to satiate all the demand, let's just say for one city like San Francisco, right. we would have needed over a thousand ice cream trucks. And there are not a thousand ice cream trucks in like the entire west coast of the United States. Um, but isn't that what a market is about, getting supply and demand right? Yeah, we, because it's a one day thing, we didn't think it was a good idea to go purchase now, I'm you just know, giving you a hard time, ice cream trucks. But, but what does it tell you about what's possible for Uber in the future? I mean, is this a meaningful experiment or is this marketing? So it's a plat so, so the, it's, it's a very simple platform, right? So I called, yeah. I called uh, my general manager of Denver yesterday when I got into Aspen and I asked him two questions. I said, you know, one is Hickenlooper still trying to put us out of business in Colorado? And two, are we, um, when are we getting Aspen up? And he's like, you want Aspen up? I'm like, yeah, like I want Aspen up. And so he was able to get it up by this morning. So Travis, that's awesome. And I want to talk about regulation, but yeah. just to go back and complete the circle yeah. on whether Uber can and is thinking actively about being more than vehicles. So the answer is yes, we're thinking about it. Yeah. Um, what we're doing right now is we're in the experimentation phase where you sort of find some interesting ways to do promotions like Uber ice cream. Sure. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, could it be that next summer we just do an entire summer of ice cream? Sure. sure. It's really very simple. Right. It's very straightforward for us to basically give them a phone with an app on it right. um, and say, look, when, you, when the thing is blinking, hit the screen and go to where the map tells you to go. Um, and don't, you know, you don't have to pick them up and take them anywhere. Just give them ice cream. Um, so, yeah. So, so now let's get to the nature of your complicated relationship with Governor Hickenlooper. Complicated. Um, uh, so I don't have much of a relationship with Hickenlooper. Okay. I spoke to him for the first time last night. Okay. So how was dinner for you? Um, dinner was good. Um, basically, the, I, what, I, what I got from, from Hickenlooper was that it, he, he, I think he gets it. I think he, he gets it. He knows that, that tech progress matters and that being a, you know, that, that making Colorado a place for tech entrepreneurs and for technology, et cetera, is a good, is a good thing. And it, it's not just good policy, it's also good for the people of the state. Um, so he, he made it very clear that he was not the one that was trying to put us out of business, but, but actually it was his appointees at the PUC that were trying to put us out of business. So um, what we're talking about really sort of feeds into something larger, Travis, yeah. which is, um, Uber gets into it a lot with regulators. It seems to be actually the chief reason that we in the media like to write about you other than that funding thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, how much of your day is actually spent dealing with those issues? So it, it ebbs and flows. Um, if two or three flare-ups happen in the same week, I'm gonna have a busy week and probably not a lot of sleep, but it can go for, you know, a lot of times, you know, there'll be a flare-up and then it sort of dies down for a while and there'll be many months where it may be very quiet or, you know, a month or two. And so, you know, the regulatory problem is not one that we look for. We go into cities where we're legal. We operate where we're legal. And what we find is in a lot of these cities, there are very strong relationships between the taxi industry and say like the Public Utilities Commission of Colorado. They're, they're good friends and they propose laws that would put us out of business. So like in Colorado, if the laws that were proposed, well, let me give you one of them. Um, no town car, uh, if the, the, there's a reg that's being proposed that says no town car can be within 200 feet of any hotel, restaurant, or bar. Huh. That means that so, no town car can be in downtown Denver. Um, when was this proposed, and what's the likelihood that anything will come of it? It was proposed earlier this year, if I'm not mistaken, right. um, and I'm not sure when it will we, this is the thing about local governments, right? I don't know if and when it becomes real. I just have to make sure that our customers who love us in the city that we're in uh, make sure that they let the world know or let certainly their government officials know uh, that they'd be very disappointed if, if they lost the ability to get around their city. Right. So let's talk about those customers who, who love you for a second. Um, you have passionate customers. You have yeah. folks who love you. You also have folks... Um, that you make very angry. And I know because they write to me, what'll happen is I'll, I'll write a piece about Uber and then I'll get a slew of messages saying, yeah, but this surge pricing thing, he charged me so much money. Yep. So can you talk a little bit in particular about 
the surge pricing in the context of yeah. when there is a, a crisis or a natural disaster like the recent Toronto floods or sure. like Hurricane Sandy? Sure. So first, surge pricing is, for those who may not know, uh, surge pricing is basically a mechanism whereby when demand outstrips supply, the price goes up. When the price goes up, because we don't own the cars nor do we employ drivers, when the price goes up, <clears throat> our partners, who are the limo companies essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, they, uh, they put more cars on the road and more drivers want to drive when the price goes up. And so we're able to get a larger percentage of our total sort of installed base on the driver's side on the system when the price goes up and therefore more trips happen. Um, so that's the premise, and, and we've sort of sure. we, we good run business it, strategy. We run it every like for instance, it's happening every Friday and Saturday night in most of the cities that we're in, as an example. Sure. Hotels do it, airlines do it, tons of different businesses do this, um, and it's just good economics. Uh, now, when when you go into a natural disaster, it gets it gets interesting. Um, the economics still play, so that if the the price goes up, more, more people are going to get rides and let, fewer people are stranded. Um, but there's sort of an emotional reaction to um, price going up when, when there's some kind of hardship underway. So right. to give you an example, in, uh, for, in New York, uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, happened. Sure. Um, the first day, we basically did surge pricing on the supply side without passing that pr the prices on to the demand side and spent $100,000 just out of our own pockets um, paying drivers uh, over and above what consumers were paying, right? right. Um, for the rest of the, the sort of period, what we did is... When you did that, Travis, yeah. did you tell the world you were doing that? Was that... Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. So. Um, but what can happen often in these situations, you can tell the world, but you know, people aren't reading your blog posts, right? People aren't, you, we can, you can send an email, we send an email to all of our customers. Um, you know. so, so you offset the first day, the prices for uh, those of us who were affected by the storm. Yep. But of course, the, the period during which we were affected was very long in that It was like a case. week, right? So, and to give you an example, like in Hurricane Sandy, you have drivers that were waiting 12 hours in line for gas. Like, it's a good week to, to, to go on vacation, right? And so, Fair. Um, <clears throat> and so if we want to get them out there, they have to, it has to be worth their time. And so um, what happened... So, so what I'm hearing, though, is that it's the driver's decision, not Uber's decision or responsibility on the pricing. What happens is the, the, the way surge pricing works is that when demand is outstripping supply, the price goes up. Right. Right? right. And so it's, at some point, it's really, it's, in some ways, it's, it's up to both demand and supply, right? So if supply comes on and, it, you know, in droves, then you have excess supply and then the price comes back down. Right. Um, so uh, talk about the competition a little bit. I mean, lots of folks want to be in your business. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the 2013 pitch that I receive most often is we are the Uber of blank. Got it, yeah. So um, aren't you the Uber of blank? I think we're the Uber of stuff. Um, but we, I, think, I think those in the investment community probably get, I mean, I, some of it gets forwarded to me. Uh, <clears throat> uh, those in the investment community see a lot of Uber of blanks. Um, if it's in our wheelhouse, right, we'll ultimately do it. And, you know, I sort of outlined the sort of lifestyle and logistics cross. Um, but there are a lot of things that don't work for it. Like we did, just for fun, we tried on-demand Texas barbecue in Austin, right, just for fun, right? So you get cornbread and Texas barbecue sandwich inside of five minutes delivered to you via a pedicab. But guess what? A Texas barbecue sandwich doesn't taste really good an hour and a half after it's made. And so you have to have a very tight supply chain. Right. Uh, very difficult to manage unless the truck itself is making the Texas barbecue. But if you have a supply chain where it's made somewhere else, it was, you get the idea. Yes. There are things that are not designed for Uber um, and there are things that are. Like a lot of, I think somebody came to me with Uber plumber, right? And I'm like, <laughs> well, you know, people use plumbers like once every five years. Sure. And so there's just not enough liquidity there to make that interesting. You can actually just pick up the phone and he'll come to you in a couple of hours and it's okay. So looking narrowly at transportation alone, Travis, yeah. um, you know, there are a slew of companies, I think Lyft is probably yeah. one of the most notable ones, sure. who are experimenting in this space. Yep. How do you think about them? Um, well, I think they were, you know, pretty interesting, uh, pre took a pretty interesting approach to things. It, 
it basically, the way to think about it, uh, Lyft basically goes into the markets that Uber is in and then gets folks who don't have commercial licenses and don't have commercial insurance and says, bring your own car and provide Uber-like service. Um, and they have a personality that they put along with that, and sort of fist bumps and the, the cars have these pink mustaches and things like that. Right. Um, it's regulatory arbitrage. Like what happened was like, they did it in California first and uh, I'm like, holy cow, every trip that's happening, I'm, I'm reading the law, every trip that's happening is a criminal misdemeanor being committed by the person driving. I don't think that's a good law, but that is the law. And so I'm just like, I'm, I'm kind of staying out of this one for a little bit and watched it happen for a year, but what they were able to do because of you know, no commercial insurance and because of um, their easy access to supply, the cost was really, really low. Right. And so you, you could see a situation where they, they'd eat you up from the bottom, the bottom up. Right. And so stay on the sidelines, go, well, the regulator's gonna do something about this. They ended up doing nothing about it, and then ultimately after a year saying, you know what, this is okay. Right. This is all right. And we ultimately signed an agreement with the state of California saying that, and so then we, we basically found a way to get non what they call non-TCP licensed transportation providers um, on board in a way that, you know, with background checks and insurance and, and things like this. Um, but ultimately, you know, as they follow us in other cities, we now have a playbook, which is if it's totally just the regulatory risk is just off the charts, we're going to stand back, watch it for 30 days, let the regulators know, look, either enforce the laws that you have in place right now or embrace it, that's right. fine, but if, if you have a policy of non-enforcement that goes 30 days, we call it regulatory ambiguity, then we're coming in too because we want to participate in this kind of innovation. So you guys are on the ground in many international markets at this point, places like Seoul and Amsterdam and Paris. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are the challenges to growing a business like this, which is very local internationally? Um, <clears throat> well, look, the way we don't look at things, we don't look at things in a country by country basis, we look at it city by city. And when you are as distributed as us, right, so a city manager basically runs day-to-day regu -day regulatory, biz dev, local marketing, customer support, social media, supply chain, and a, and a whole bunch of other things. They're really running a business. When you have your smartest people distributed around the world running the, your business, um, part of our culture in order to make that work is what we call celebrate the cities, right? And so you then create management structures that sort of are geared around that. And, and so once, you, once your culture is that way, uh, where you empower cities to do things, um, and once your culture is the way where, where you wanna feel local in that city, then things just start to just be natural. So we have an Uber playbook, but then there are things you can't do, but any, anything other than what you can't do, go for it, have fun. So um, we know that there are many people in these international cities trying to do this faster than you can yeah. do it, and folks like the yeah. Samoir brothers have built a whole reputation on popping up these pop-up companies. Yeah. Um, are you, how do you plan to move faster than they do in places that are foreign to you? Well, look, I think, you know, you know replicating, you know, a, you know, making a Groupon clone is very different than making an Uber clone. Um, and the Samwar brothers just recently came out with their Uber clone. Um, but the thing is, is that it's in, in some ways the, the three years, it's their three, we, we are three years into getting very good at replicating. And so I have a very strong team out there launching cities all the time. And our playbook is really, really good. And so in some ways, I'm actually kind of, I'm kind of pumped up because if the Samwar, I want to see how good the Samwar brothers are. Like, let's do this. Um, so he's pumped. Yeah, so. So, so. so let's turn to the audience here. We've got a lot of folks. Anybody got a question? Okay, we got a bunch back here. We're going to start with you and then go to you. And please give us your name when you ask. Yeah, Mark Mahaney at RBC. You talk about your growth strategy a little bit more and how you think about the pace of rollouts to new cities. Do you feel like you're in a position now where the greater risk is not rolling out uh, fast enough or is the risk greater in rolling out too quickly? Um, I, I, I feel we're pretty, we're pretty solid in terms of rolling, quick, rolling out in cities quickly. Like, actually, what, I think the bottleneck at this point is really people, right? So you, I think maybe what you mean by rolling out too quickly is rolling out in places where you don't have good people running it, right? So really then the, the pressure goes from, you know, 
sort of the structural, like let's set up an entity in Mexico City, which we soft launched a few weeks ago, it took us three months to get that set up, right? Um, to, well, we have all the corporate structuring and all this stuff set up. We know how to operate internationally. We know how to clear in different currencies. But then it's like, well, HR. Where's HR in terms of getting the right, you know, really good people in these cities? And so we're always trying to push the boundary there. Um, and there's an expertise in doing that. And for sort of a hyper growth type company, that ultimately becomes the make it or break it in terms of did you expand too fast or not, is did you get quality people on the ground in all the places that you're in, and do you have a quality playbook in place for them to follow? So let's jump right over here. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Phil Lippin with Evernote. Um, Travis, I, about what you said about search pricing. Uh, yeah. I've paid it a couple of times, and I've never had a bad experience with it. I've always yeah. thought, yeah, this makes sense. It's upfront. I'd, I'm happy to trade off some money for, for time here. Where I think it might become problematic is um, if it could be used by the local operators to, to really game the system to have mm -hmm. artificial scarcity. So I think as long as you optimize yeah. it for, we want the price that results in the most rides, that's, that's great. You're kind of yeah. on the right moral side here. But there does seem to be this danger where once the operators figure out how to manipulate it, they can optimize for how much money they're making. How do you think about that? How do you try to prevent that? Well, look, this is a marketplace for transportation, right? So. This is the question you basically put is like, can somebody corner the market, right? Does somebody have like half of the puts on corns, you know, on corn commodity or, you know, something like this, right? And so our, the way Uber works in the cities that we're in is that it's, they're almost all hyper fragmented marketplaces where there's lots of very small providers, like thousands of them. And so it's basically not really plausible that they'd be able to corner the market. Um, uh, there's probably a bunch of other mechanisms we could put in place to make sure that that doesn't happen, but it goes against the DNA of our company for that kind of thing to happen. So if, if for whatever reason somebody was gaming it, um, we would we would put we you know we we control that marketplace. We we have we're the, we're in the middle. We are the marketplace. We would make sure marketplaces don't work when people are cheating, and so we'd make sure that that wasn't happening. Any other questions in the audience? Right there. Yes, Glenn Cager from Light Street Capital. I used your taxi service a couple weeks ago in Chicago and found yep. it to be great. I'm wondering if that has uh, that product has helped your rela relationship with the taxi commissions. Uh, that I, I wish it were true, but it's not. So in Chicago, we do black car SUV. We do something called UberX, which is like a low cost Uber. Um, we also do taxis. It's an incredibly popular product. Um, the problem, and I'm glad that it went well for you, the, the thing that can happen on the taxi product, though, is that if somebody accepts a ride, and I'll, I'll get to your question in a second, if somebody accepts, if the driver accepts the ride, um, but then somebody flags him down on the way to pick you up, he's got to feed his family. And he'll take that guy who hailed him and cancel your trip. And so we see the, the sort of completion rates, what we call request to completion ratio, in taxi, the taxi product is far inferior to the sort of fully dedicated like a, an a Uber product or UberX product. And getting to your point, um, the taxi industry, we're putting more money in the taxi industry when we work with taxis like in Chicago, but they don't like that we, are, we become their distribution channel. A couple um, more questions back here. Sorry to cut you off, but let's go over to the middle and back one. To, is that Deep? I can't see from here. Yeah. Hi, Deep Nishar, LinkedIn. Uh, so I'm curious, besides regulatory reasons, uh, what makes a city not a good city for Uber? So why Seoul but not Mumbai? Um, so anybody who's done business in India knows that it's pretty tough to get started if you're a foreign company. Um, and I think we're just going through the process right now of getting things set up in India. Um, so you're going to see us you know, really start going in there deeply. but. But certain, Seoul is easier to do business in than Mumbai. And that's the bottom line. Got it. And right in front of you in the green shirt. Great. Travis, thank you. Dominic from Pandora. Yep. I'm curious in terms of your broader reflections on technology keeping, or rather regulatory environments keeping up with technology. This seems to be a very um, prescient kind of debate constantly yep. with Uber, with uh, Airbnb, with sure. Pandora. And we benefit from compulsory licenses. But technology, uh, or rather regulation fails to keep up with technology. Can yeah. you give us, are these going to be local battles or is it going to be more of a federal uh, yeah. debate? Well, I think 
Typically, Uber's running into local battles wherever we, you know, not wherever, but in a lot of the places that we go. And it's because the taxi industry is used to um, keeping competition out through regulation. They do anti-competitive things by working with local governments to do so. It is illegal to be anti-competitive um, on your own, but if you do it through a local government in the United States, then it's legal. Um, the, I think the really interesting part about, about can regulation keep up is, um, is it's a tough one because regula re you know, regulators often um, are sort of, they're sort of catching up just, that's just the nature of things. Um, federal versus local, uh, the FTC has weighed in on a number of battles that we've sort of been in and sort of said, look, these cities are doing anti-competitive things and it's against the interests of the consumer and against the interests of the drivers um, and it should stop. Um, but the way the Constitution is written in a lot of ways, like, uh, you know, there's certain things that local governments can do that are outside the scope of antitrust, basically. Couple more questions in here. Uh, right up front, we got. I'm going to go to JP for. Oh, to the left of JP. Sorry. Yeah, my name's Larry Gelman, and I work for Robert W. Baird, and have a son that works for Uber uh, overseas. What's uh, his name? Sam Gelman. Oh, okay. Here we go. And we need to talk <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Very but, good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in any event, I wanted to uh, ask you when you when you talk about things like uh, ice cream and flowers on Valentine's Day, yeah. is this really a way of further making the brand iconic and, and, and a wow phenomenon, or is this actually something you think you can make money? Um, look, when we do a test, it's, it's the former. It's, the, it's doing something that captures people's imaginations. But honestly, when we first started Uber, that's what it was about too. When Garrett and I got Uber running, you know, up and running, it wasn't about taking over the world or doing, you know, doing a big, you know, doing, having a big company, it was about pushing a, us and our 100 friends pushing a button and a Mercedes rolling up in just a couple of minutes. And it was that wow factor. And uh, we, like, we like to say we wanted to be baller in SF, right? So um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, where, 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 where these things end up, we don't know. But I think what it, what it shows is the experimental and sort of creative culture that we have at our company. Any other questions out there? Way in the back. Stephen Wolf Beneta from Starcar Media Best Group. You are creating marketplaces for lots of different utilities. I think there's also an opportunity for brands to participate. Have you thought about ways that you could work with the Procter and Gamble's of the world, the Coca Cola's of the world, and actually inject advertising and brands into your experience? Yeah. Spoken like a question from someone from Starcom. Uh, yeah. So you know, this is a question that comes up every once in a while. Sort of uh, just straight up advertising is something you're probably not going to see on Uber. You know, if the average ride is, you know, let's just say it's 25 bucks and we're getting 20% of that, like what kind of CPM are you talking about? A $5,000 CPM, if you're talking in advertising terms, like it doesn't really make sense. And honestly, it's not good for the customer. But um, in situations where we do things with brands where it actually makes for a unique and interesting experience, we did something with HBO where we literally had like 1930s Studebakers uh -huh. like on the system in New York, like that's something we can do. That sounds pretty cool. Uh, what else have we got here? JP. Hey, Travis. JP from Fortune. So you, you talked about partnerships with companies like HBO. You've also talked about goods which can be successfully delivered, roses versus awesome barbecue, for instance. Sure. Um, but what about partnerships that sort of further utilize Uber drivers' downtime more so? For instance, I know you've had discussions with a specific e-commerce CEO about the idea of same-day delivery of goods. How likely is something like that? Does it conform to Uber's mission? Oh man. Okay, so I think again it goes back to the lifestyle and logistics, right? Is that if we can help somebody get a product or something that they want right now, give it to me right now, and we are in the business of delivering it, great, right? So somebody goes, Travis, you've got this great lifestyle brand, you know, Uber's, you know, so awesome and high end and all this. When are you going to do concierge services or when are you going to do hotels? And I'm like, we're not gonna do hotels because we're not delivering a hotel building to you, right? So we know what we are, but maybe we do like Uber Camper or something, like we'll bring a camper to you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Imaginative. So it, it just falls in line with that, JP. A yeah. uh, couple, couple more questions back here. Hi, my name's Charlotte, I'm from change.org. 
Uh, I know Uber has used our platform to start many petitions in different cities yep. uh, to rally your, your fan base. And I'm wondering if you can speak more to uh, your broad strategy of engaging Uber users to actually right. help you in your fight against unfair regulations. Yep. So uh, change.org has actually been quite helpful for us in some of these regulatory things that we've done. Um, and the, uh, what we do, if you, get, if you talk to people who are p politicos, they'll say that Uber has good outside game, not good inside game. Right? So outside in, customers speaking on their own behalf, talking to the people that make policy or make regulations. We're very, very good at getting people to speak out about things that are, we feel are wrong. Um, not as good on the inside game, and uh, it's you know, the, the whole like we don't go in and ask for permission and things like this. Um, but uh, but that's, that's how we look at it. And I think change.org has been actually quite awesome in helping us do that. Okay, we got time for one more quick question. Uh, nobody liked the word quick, great. Um, so Travis, I wanna thank you for coming out. Um, I wanna thank you for the ice cream, the barbecue, and all of the really cool yep. things, and in particular, the cars. Yep. And I want you to invite, us to tell, invite you to tell us as soon as you can about any news which may or may not be happening Fair here enough. in Aspen. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. All right, awesome. <laughs> So now it's my um, 